So, so here's where we are. We're, we're halfway into the Ten Commandments. This is the sixth command. We've already studied five of them. Let me give you just a, a really quick review of the first five. And in the first command, we saw that God wants to be number one in your life. He's not satisfied being number two. He's not satisfied being number three. God wants to and deserves to be the top priority in your life and in mine. Mark preached a message and showed us that he is worthy of our worship. He's worthy not just of our church attendance, but he's worthy of our worship, not just on Sunday morning, but he's worthy of our worship 24-7 every day of the week. Brad brought a great message teaching us that we must properly use God's name. We shouldn't take it in vain. And at times we're guilty of that in prayer. At times we're guilty of that in worship. We're guilty of that in teaching. We're guilty of that in our songs. We must make sure that we honor his name and lift up his name who is worthy to be praised. Jose brought a wonderful message teaching us that trusting in God results in rest. Not just spiritual rest, but trusting in God results in physical rest as well. I was reading yesterday in Isaiah chapter 26 and where it says that you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed, who is focused on you. We can have chaos all around us. We can have unrest all around us. And yet by by focusing on God and by trusting in him, you and I can experience true rest. Last week we saw the fifth commandment that, that we honor God as we honor our parents. And it was amazing. I, I, I've been blown away by the response because it was one of those messages that I thought was just going to be ho-hum. And so many of you have responded how God used that message to speak to your heart to maybe even restore or better your relationship with your parents. I read this week about a volunteer in children's ministry who had been teaching the Ten Commandments. And, and uh, on this specific day, she taught about that fifth command, that you should honor your parents. And the kids were all into it. And as she ended her teaching on the fifth commandment, honoring the parents, she just asked. She said, hey, let me ask, is there a command that deals with how you should relate to your brothers and sisters? And one of the kids right away yells out, thou shalt not kill. Sometimes we feel that way, whether it's with our siblings or whether it's with our spouse or whether it's with our neighbors. So would you, would you dive in with me for just a few moments and let's look exactly what the Holy Spirit of God has for us in this command today. So the first thing, if you're following along in your notes, we talk about the act of murder. So, so as, as, as Moses was given those commands, the sixth command, very simple, four words, you shall not murder. The, the word murder there in the Hebrew is a, is a very specific word. It speaks of the unlawful taking of a human life. It's a word that's used very few times in the Old Testament. Let me tell you, first of all, what it doesn't mean. It does not refer to the killing of animals. All right, you might be here today and you're an animal rights protagonist and you might use this verse to, to, to prove your point. That's not what this verse is talking about. This verse does not refer to war. It has nothing to do with soldiers or armies going to war. There's other words that are used in reference to that, but this word does not talk about that. This word has nothing to do with self-defense. Someone attacks you when you defend yourself and you take another life. That's not the word that it's used here. That's a different word. Nor is it the word that it's used in reference to capital punishment. That's a different word as well. The, this word refers to two types of homicide. And you get this. The first is this. The Bible prohibits intentional murder. The Bible prohibits intentional murder. That's the, th that, that's the main thought behind the sixth command. Whether premeditated or spontaneous, whether first degree or second degree, to take the life of a fellow human being is clearly condemned by God. We all get that, right? We all understand that. The Bible prohibits intentional murder. 
But this word is also used, interestingly, it's not only used in reference to intentional murder, but it's also used in reference to negligent murder. The the Bible also prohibits negligent murder. Let me show you an example, and we'll kind of flush it out because it's an Old Testament example. In the very next chapter, in Exodus chapter 21, as Moses is giving the laws to the Israelites, notice what he says in verses 28 and 29 of Exodus chapter 21. He says, when an ox gores a man or a woman to death. Let me just pause for a second, and I realize probably none of us have an ox at home, okay? Anybody have an ox at home? All right, I didn't think so. All right, so, so, okay. Matt, Matt said he does. I know he talked about a donkey this week with me. I'm not sure, all right? All right, so, so follow along. When an ox gores a man or a woman to death, the ox shall be stoned, and its flesh shall not be eaten, but the owner of the ox shall not be liable. All right, so, okay, so, so you have an ox at home. Your ox gets out of its pen, and it gores a man or a woman to death. The Bible says in that case, the owner of the ox is not liable, all right? Uh, um, the ox shall be killed but the owner is not liable. But notice, but if the ox has been accustomed to gore in the past, in other words, it's not the first time that it did that. It's gotten out of the pen over and over and over again. And it's, it's gored some people and hurt some people. If it's gored someone in the past and its owner has been warned but has not kept it in and it kills a man or a woman, the ox shall be stoned. But notice what it says. And its owner shall be put to death. So all of a sudden the story changes. All of a sudden, because of the negligence of someone, a man or a woman dies. And the Bible says not only is that ox guilty, but the owner is guilty of negligent homicide. You might sit back today and say, so glad I don't have an ox. Don't have to worry about that. All right, none of us rode an ox here today, all right? But we did ride a car. (laughs) All right, and sometimes because the negligence of others, someone loses a life. So, so here's, what, here's what the command is saying, whether it come or when it comes to human life, ignorance and negligence and carelessness are not an excuse. God says don't kill, don't intentionally take a life, and don't negligently take a life. Why is that? There's a truth behind that. And the truth very simply is this, if you're following along, every life is important to God. Every life is important to God. That is such a significant truth. God places an extremely high value on his most important, his most significant creation, which is you and me. And notice two truths where we're kind of fleshing this out. The first thing I wrote down is this. God is the giver and taker of life. He's the one that says that. Um, Brad read just a a little bit ago, 1 Samuel chapter 2, that great prayer of Hannah's. And in that that prayer, Hannah makes this statement. She says, the Lord kills and the Lord brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and he raises up. God is the giver and the taker of life. You and I don't have that right. The second thing I want you to see, though, is this. Everyone is made in the image of God. That's the Latin phrase, imago Dei. Everyone is made in God's image. Two verses I want you to see. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. John chapter 9 and verse 6. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. You were created in God's image. Turn to the person beside you and say, I was created in God's image. Do that, all right? Tell them you were created in God's image. We all were created in God's image. Every human being, no matter their race, no matter their socioeconomic level, no matter their education, no matter their political party, every single person was created in God's image. And every person, to a certain degree, reflects the image of God. 
What does that mean, man? We could flesh that out big time, and I won't take the time today, but, but we were mentally created in God's image. You and I were given the ability to become rational, volitional creatures. We have the ability to take situations and think through situations, to figure things out, to put things together. God has given us the ability to do that. We were created morally in his image. Every single one of us today has a conscience, something that other creatures do not possess. We were created in his image morally. We were created in his image socially. We, we were created to fellowship with one another. And that fellowship that we have with one another is a reflection of the Trinity because God fellowships with himself. God the Father with God the Son and God the Son with God the Holy Spirit. This inter-Trinitarian relationship that exists. You and I were created in that image as well. And so as a result, God says, every man, every woman was created in my image. So God says this, you shall not murder. God prohibits the act of murder. We could end right now and you walk away thinking, I ace that one, Brian. Piece of cake. Let me take it to a second level. Because when the Bible talks about murder, it not only talks about the act of murder, but it talks about the attitude of murder. And so, so if you have your Bibles, if you have an old-fashioned Bible like I do, put your finger and go, put your finger here in Exodus and go with me to the New Testament, Matthew chapter 5. If you have an iPhone or whatever, just kind of flip through it. But, but in Matthew chapter 5, we see that Jesus talks about not the act of murder, but he talks about the attitude of murder. And here's what's happening. Jesus raises the bar to include not only the precept, but also the principle. In the Old Testament, they talk about the precept, the act. And here in the New Testament, God says, okay, we get that. We understand the precept. We understand the act. Now, what is the principle behind the act? What is the foundational belief behind the act? And Jesus, as he always does, raises the bar for us. And so notice with me in Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 and 22. We'll put them up on the screen. Matthew 5, 21 and 22. Jesus said, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. We understand that. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 13. But notice what Jesus says. But I say to you. So Jesus takes the precept of the command and he raises the bar and now he talks about the principle of the command. What is the foundational truth behind that? But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So here's what Jesus does. Jesus concludes that outward actions are motivated by inward emotions. Jesus concludes that outward actions are motivated by inward emotions. You see, you and I can only judge the outside. I look at Mike Rioiano today and I think, boy, this is, what a nice looking guy. He's like one of the nicest guys in the world. He's well-dressed, he's well-kept, his hair's combed. I'm sure Saida probably combed his hair before he came to church today or something. But I, but I look at him and externally, Mike has it all together. He does. But only God knows what's on the inside. Only God can see his heart. You and I look on the outward, but God looks on the inward. Today you might be looking at how I'm dressed today, and I was a little, I was, I was a little self-conscious today because uh, I know my pants are a little bit out of style. I got pleats in my pants, and I'm not supposed to wear pleats in your pants, and I have cuffs on my pants, and you're not supposed to have cuffs on your pants, and I'm a little, I'm a little out of date today, and you might be looking at that, but I want you to know God's not even interested in that today. God's not sitting back saying, boy, Brian bought a jacket today, but he left it down on the front row. What's the deal with all of that? It's 
God's looking at my heart. And God's looking at your heart today. And so when God talks about the idea of murder, he's not just talking about the outward expression of it, but he's talking about the inward motivation. He's talking about the emotions that drive us to do that. Notice another verse in Matthew chapter 15, verses 18 through 20. But what comes out of the mouth, Jesus says, proceeds from the heart. And this is what defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. Those aren't external actions. Those are internal desires that begin in the heart and later are carried out. I would venture to say that there are many, 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 many people in the world who have never committed the violent act of murder by their hands or with their body, but they have thought about it in their heart. They've allowed their sinful thoughts to take control of them. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 22, Jesus says, But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to the judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says you fool will be liable to hell fire. Let me just pause for a second and say Jesus is not condemning all forms of anger. Because you might sit back and say, why, Jesus himself got angry. He walked in the temple and he cast out the money changers and he demonstrated anger. He's not condemning all forms of anger. Sometimes anger is justified. When a pedophile abuses a child, I get angry. That's justifiable anger. When When a wife is physically abused by her husband, I get angry. That's justifiable anger. When the dolphins fumble on the one yard line, I get angry. (laughs) That's justifiable anger, is it not? Now, I mean, unless you go out and murder somebody, all right, as a result of that. Here's what Jesus is talking about. Here's what Jesus is saying. If you follow me along your notes, he's saying, uncontrolled anger leads to physical murder. That's what he's doing. He's connecting the dots. He's connecting the dots. He's saying it's not that somebody just wakes up one morning and out of the blue they're this unbelievably super godly person that has their emotions in checks and all of a sudden they go out and violently murder someone. He says, no, 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 what? There there are inner thoughts that are inner motivations that lead to that. And God says, man, I want to deal with the motivations before it ever results in the actions. So, so, So you might be here today, and you're probably here today, and say, Brian, never picked up a knife in my entire life. I've never pointed a gun at anybody else. I've never grabbed my wife by the throat and shook her. God bless you. I'm so glad you haven't done that. But God is not just satisfied with that. God is looking at your heart today. And God is saying that uncontrolled anger does not honor God. As a matter of fact, uncontrolled anger is a work of the flesh. Self-control is a work of the Holy Spirit of God. And so when God comes in our life, he changes us and he molds us and shapes us and he tones down that anger so that we become more like him. He says a second thing, contempt leads to personal Murder. Let me explain what I'm talking about. He says in the passage, he says, uh, and whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. The word insults in the passage comes from the term raka. If you, if you have an older King James Bible, it might even says whoever says raka to his brother. Raka was a term of abuse. Raka was a name of contempt. Here's what, here, here, here's what raka meant. It had the idea of dismissing a person, of eliminating a person from your life, of acting as if that person no longer exists. That's what I mean by personal murder. You've never raised a knife. You've never pulled a gun. You've never caused bodily harm, but you have eradicated a person from your life. You have eliminated a person from your life. Someone hurts you, I get it. Someone maybe abused you, I get it. And you said, hey, you know what? 
I'm having nothing to do with that person. They're going to call, not going to answer the phone. I am eliminating that person from my life completely. I'm looking at that person and I'm saying, Raka with you. You are out of my life. And Jesus says, if you do that, you are guilty before God. So I mentioned I'm pretty confident there's nobody here that's ever physically taken a life. But is there someone in your life that you've gotten so mad at? You've been hurt by them so much that you looked at them and you basically said, Raka, you're out of here. I'm eradicating you from my life completely. A friend took advantage of you, a spouse who emotionally devastated you, an employer who wrongly fired you. Whatever the reason, you have removed them from your life. Now, now, now follow me today. Follow me. The question is not whether they deserve it. That's not the question. They might deserve it. The question is not whether they deserve it, but the question is, How would Jesus treat them? How would Jesus respond to them? Church, we are now governed by a new truth. We are now governed by a new set of laws that are higher, that are nobler, that are holier than the laws of our land. Yes, we're citizens of the United States, but we are citizens of the kingdom of God. And as citizens of the kingdom of God, we are called to act like our king and to respond like our king. Jesus raises the bar. Yeah, he says, don't take someone else's life. But Jesus raises the bar to such a degree that all of us are capable of murder. You see, murder is much more than just taking a life. The Bible talks about the act of murder, the attitude of murder. Let me show you a third thing. I want you to see the attitude and actions of Jesus Christ. Because as, uh, as I look at my relationships and how I should treat the people in my life that hurt me, and as you look at your relationships and you think how you should treat the people that hurt you, our example is not our parents. Our example is not Pastor Brian. Our example is not somebody else. Our example is none other than Jesus Christ himself. And so as his citizens, as his children, we are called to act like him. So let's just pause for a second and ask ourselves the question, how did Jesus respond when he was accused? How did Jesus respond when he was innocently condemned? How did Jesus respond when he was unrightly beaten and condemned and murdered? How did Jesus respond? He is our supreme example. Let me make sure I say it like I say it in your notes. I wrote this. Jesus lovingly forgave his accusers and his murderers. Hey, think with me today. If I was Jesus, I got to confess, I would have responded completely different. If I was Jesus and I had just been drugged before a Sanhedrin meant to spend all night awake. By the way, you don't want to be around me if I've spent awake all night long. All right, Jesus spent the night awake, accused, having to defend himself. He was then taken outside of the city, and he was beaten with a cat of nine tails. He had a crown of thorns placed upon his head. He was forced to carry a cross to Golgotha. When he got to the top of Golgotha, they laid the cross. He was forced to lay down and they drove spikes into his hands and his feet. That cross was then placed into the ground and it was dropped in the ground to such a degree that the psalmist said that all of his bones were out of place. He was in incredible pain. If that would have been me, if that would have been me, I would have looked down at my accusers I would have looked down at my murderers and said this, pardon my French, I would have said, I will see you in hell. 
is what I would have told them. I probably would have gotten down off that cross and beat the living daylights out of them. With my divine power, I would have done that. That's not what Jesus did. If anybody was ever innocent, it was Jesus. If anybody was ever wrongly accused, it was Jesus. If anybody had a right to defend himself, it was Jesus. And yet he looked at his accusers and he said this, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they are doing. Let me read a passage of scripture in 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2. Peter, Peter fleshes this out just a little bit more. Peter says, for to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. Let me pause for a second because you and I might sit back and say, okay, Brian, I get it. That's Jesus. I'm not Jesus. He was perfect. I'm not perfect. He was God. I'm not God. I expect God to respond that way. Don't expect me. How can God expect me to respond that way? Notice what the text says. He left you an example that you and I would follow in his steps. In other words, that we would respond like him. Can we put the, the verse back up? How did he respond? He committed no sin. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he didn't revile in return. When he suffered, he didn't threaten I mean, could you imagine? I would have been spewing out every threat you can imagine. Jesus holding the world in his hands. The eternity of his accusers were literally in his hands. He knew that he was not only being murdered by them, but one day he would stand and personally judge them. He didn't threaten. He didn't threaten at all. But he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. So here's what he says. I've left you an example that you and I should follow in his steps. One last thing in your notes. Jesus commands his followers not just to love their friends, but to love their enemies as well. Uh, one of the most convicting passages of Scripture, we studied it last year as we went through the Sermon on the Mount, but I want you to see it again. Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 48. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you so that you may be the sons of your Father who is in heaven because he makes his son to rise On the evil and on the good, he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. I mean, God graciously demonstrates his love to the wicked as well as to the good. He does that. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles, the pagans, do that. He says this, therefore, you be perfect. You be mature, just as your Father in heaven is mature. You see, here's the deal, church. The gospel calls us to raise it to a different level level. It caused us to respond in such a way that the world is blown away by our response. We no longer respond in a way that we're justified to respond. We now respond like Jesus responded. And people abuse us and they mistreat us and we love them. Why? Because Jesus loves Let me show you two stories, and I'm done. Eric Fitzgerald was a young pastor. Eric had a wife and a beautiful daughter, and one day Eric Fitzgerald's life was dramatically changed. His wife and his daughter, his expectant wife and his daughter were in a car. An EMT who had worked all night long, who was tired, coming home from work, shouldn't have been behind the wheel, fell asleep at the wheel, 
smashed into the car of Eric Fitzgerald's wife. His wife was killed. The baby inside his wife's womb was killed. The daughter miraculously survived. Eric's response was nothing short of extraordinary. Matthew Swatzel, the man responsible for taking the lives of his family, um, Eric responded to him not only with compassion and with love, but he actually stood before the courts and defended the man who took his wife's life. Today, Google the story. Look at the testimony. Today, Eric is Matthew's spiritual mentor. They get together on a weekly basis and do breakfast together, and Eric ministers in Matthew's life. Now, from a human perspective, does Eric have all the right in the world to get mad? He most certainly does. Does Eric have all the right in the world to tell him, I don't want anything to do with you. Don't even come near me. From a human point of view, he does. But the gospel propels Eric to live differently. And Matthew, Matthew's life has been dramatically changed because of Eric. In 1993, Mary Johnson lost her only son, her only son was killed by a man named Oshia Israel during an argument in a party. Immediately, Mary's response was, this guy needs to spend the rest of his life in prison, and he was. Oshia Israel was condemned, and he was, he was sentenced to a life in prison. But the Holy Spirit of God began to get a hold of Mary's heart, and Mary was convicted of her response towards Oshua, Oshea, and she began advocating for his release. After 17 years in prison, Oshea was released. Guess where Oshea lives right now? Right beside Mary. She is ministering in his life. The man who took her son's life who she humanly has a right to be angry with and say, I want nothing to do with you. Because of the gospel, she reached down and realizes that she has been forgiven of a crime much greater than this man committed to her, against her son. And she has lovingly embraced him and is demonstrating the truth of the gospel to him. So, so, so here's the truth for us today. Here's the application point. The gospel propels us to act and react differently. Because of Jesus, we love and we care for those whom we would normally dislike. We love and we care for those with whom we would normally differ. The gospel changes us. So this idea of don't murder is much deeper than just the taking of a human life. It deals not only with the external actions, but it deals with the internal desires of our hearts. Mm -hmm.